Okay, we'd like to welcome all of our YouTube viewers tonight. We've been talking about on a series called The Father's Discipline. Fatherhood principle is that God disciplines, corrects, trains, reproves, reprimands, whatever He needs to do to those whom He loves. How many of uh, know you're loved by God? Well, if you're loved by God, and a true father is going to discipline you. You might not like it, it might not feel good, but he will discipline you. And he will develop us, mature us, do everything he can to grow us up beyond the elementary into the deeper things of God. So one of the things we talked about last week uh, that is a kind of a requirement prerequisite or whatever to, to be able to embrace the Father's discipline is we have to have a teachable spirit, don't we? Teachable spirit is a spirit that is open to receive, doesn't take correction as rejection, is not a know-it-all. How I many of you know what a know-it-all is? We were kids, we used to run around and say, you're a know-it-all, you're a know-it-all. It's not a person that's arrived, but it's a person that knows that they've got things to learn. They also know that they'll always have things to learn, that they've never arrived. There's a type of uh, part of them that's very humble, it's approachable, it's a good listener, and, uh, has, a, has a sense of, uh, of wisdom about him where he realizes and knows that he knows that you know, that if I'm going to grow and I'm going to change and I'm going to learn and I'm going to, I'm going to have to be teachable. That means I'm going to have to be open-minded to allowing people to speak into my life the truth. And with that, he knows that he not only will get, get be wise, but he'll get wiser and he'll listen and he'll learn and he'll grow and he'll get even smarter and more wiser. Amen? Amen. So tonight I want to talk about the spirit of humility. This is kind of a sort of a part two, but it kind of complements and goes hand in hand. I didn't know whether to teach on the spirit of pride or the spirit of humility, but we know we know about pride, don't we? Yeah. I mean, you no know, pride comes before fall. Sure. <laughs> One of our biggest problems in our recovery is that prideful, haughty, arrogant, arrived, self righteous religious spirit that uh, you know thinks he knows it all and whenever we think we've arrived then watch out pride is a comes before destruction it's a prelude whenever we get prideful forget where we come from it's just a matter of time before we eat relapse <clears throat> Corinthians also says says uh, let he who uh, thinks he stand take heed lest he fall Listen to that. Let, let he who, st who stands, let that person think that stands, that's arrived, that's learned everything, be careful because you're getting ready to get knocked off your high horse. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to get knocked off my high horse. I'd rather politely, <coughs> calmly get off my high horse and humble myself. <clears throat> but the spirit of humility is, is, uh, is about true humility. It's a spirit. It's an attitude. I mean, no attitude is a choice. Despite what's going on around me, the last of all human rights is the ability for me to choose my own attitude in any given situation. No one can steal my joy. No one can choose my attitude. Bad things can happen, but either way, I don't have to let another person's reactions or what their attitudes cause my, me to have a bad attitude. One of the characteristics and the character qualities of all great saints, of all true men of God, is they they walk they walk in a spirit of humility. They they walk in true humility. It's not a false humility. It's a genuine, real deal humility uh, that comes from the heart. It realizes, uh, you know, uh, when they get prideful, when they get arrogant. How I many you know we're all going to get prideful? I mean, that's just. We're just those kinds of people. We're going to get prideful. We're going to get arrogant. We're going to get haughty-minded. We're going to get too big for our britches. We're going to think there's going to be times when we get self-righteous. And, and that's okay. But the key is when that happens is, is, is to realize that 
and instead of allowing the spirit of pride to take over us, we, we choose to shift to a spirit of humility, of brokenness. We, we make ourselves low. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And we let the spirit of humility dictate rather than the spirit of pride dictate. We have a choice. We can, we can dictate to that pride or it can dictate to us. And but like I say, a true character quality of truly, truly godly men is they have a teachable spirit. And they walk. There's a habit. There's a lifestyle. There's a practice, a way about their life that they recognize when they're getting where and they immediately catch themselves, step back, and they humble themselves and they bring God back into the center of it. And it's, it's not just, it's not a one-time or two-time event. It's a lifestyle. It's a habit of, of walking with God. It's something... That we're going to have to learn. If we're going to grow and we're going to mature, we're going to develop. We're going to have to be teachable. And we're going to have to be humble. We're going to have to walk with the spirit and attitude of humility. Humility is the word. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It means to be humble or lowliness of mind. It refers to lowliness of, of, of an attitude. It's a self-abasement. Self means it's a choice where we abase ourselves. The word actually means to make low. The actual dictionary says it's a state of being humble or an act of humility of, of making one's low. It's, in other words, it's a, it's, it's a character quality to have where you recognize when you get high-minded and haughty and that kind of spirit and you choose to, to make yourself low. You recognize it and you make it. That, that's what humility is all about. It's a choice. Luke 14, 11 says that everyone... Everyone. How I many know you're, you're everyone? You're part of that, okay? Mm -hmm. Everyone. Whether you've the most heathenous, narcissistic, prideful person in the world, or you're the most humble person, every person, Luke 14, 11 says, everyone who exalts himself up, the word means to lift yourself up or to elevate yourself or to have a lofty, elevated opinion of yourself will be humbled. It means he'll be brought low. But everyone who humbles himself, makes himself low, but makes himself, he will be exalted. He'll be lifted up. I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd like to be lifted up rather than made low. I have an old saying, come easy or come hard, but you will come. So, what it says right there is that I can walk in humility and I can make myself low. I can live with that spirit and that kind of attitude and God's okay with that. But, but if I won't humble myself when pride comes, then God will do it for me. So I can walk, I can ride my high horse and refuse to pay attention to that high-minded spirit or I can politely, proactively humble myself, get on my horse, and I don't have to be humble. But I would rather be humble than to be humble. I'd rather be my choice than God's choice. But either way, everybody will be humble. So we have a choice. We can be humble or be humble. Amen? Amen. Turn with me tonight to Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 8. Paul is talking to the Philippians. He says, Therefore, if, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection or any compassion, Paul tells them, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, same mind means to be of the same purpose. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Then in verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit. Amplified says, Do nothing from factional motives, through conscientiousness uh, and strife, selfishness, or unworthy ends, prompted by conceit or empty arrogance, 
but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves the Amplified says instead have a spirit of humility or true humility a lowliness of mind let each of you regard others as better than and superior to himself not thinking more highly thinking more highly of one another than you do your own selves <coughs> do not merely look out for your own personal interests don't esteem and look upon and be concerned merely for your own interests but also for the interest of others Whereas don't, don't, don't all the time be looking out for your own rear end. How can I say that tonight? There's nothing wrong with our own interests. I mean, you know, we've got to be concerned with our own interests. But, it, but my own interests, my own wealth, and my own well-being should never <coughs> be at the expense of, of caring about everybody else's interests. Are you with me? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let the same attitude and purpose, a humble of mind, the spirit which is in you, let it be your example in humility. How I many of you know if, if we just practiced, if we just practiced that right there? I mean, you know, they, you know, I haven't heard that word in a long time, conceited. It used to be big back when I was in high school. That person is so conceited. That means they're so arrogant, they're so full of themselves. What Paul's saying, right? Don't, don't be conceited. Don't get so self-absorbed. Don't become so narcissistic, so caught up in your own little world that you forget about everybody else. Don't esteem yourself, but esteem. Consider, he says, consider other people more highly than yourselves. Esteem them. Hold them higher. Consider them superior to you. I mean, you know, that right there would change the whole world right there. Just think of right now in this world. I mean, you know, we've been in this pandemic, and you go to Walmart, and people are fighting over toilet paper. Black Friday, they're fighting over black or screen TVs, flat screen TVs. I mean, you know, it, it gets really nasty and ugly out there. Just think what it would be right now if just the body of Christ decided that we would not just be so caught up and concerned about my own interests, but I would shift and I would truly be working and I would consider other people as more important and more superior than myself. Jesus said that we're to love one another, but He went higher than that. But the new commandment is that we're to love one another as He's loved us. Think how much He's loved us. And it says, I'm not just to love other people, but I'm to love other people just like He's loved us. I don't know about you, but God's loved me pretty doggone good. Well, that would change the whole world. So it goes on and says, but have this attitude, or this same attitude and purpose, this humble mind, it was in Christ Jesus. Let Him be your example. It was in Him. Now let it be in you. Let him be your example. Let him be your own model. It says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or to, a thing to be retained. One version, I like what it says. It says, even though he, he was basically God, he chose not to allow himself to be uh, to, to be God-like. The word was is robbery. In other words, he, how many of you ever heard the term highway robbery? Man, that's highway robbery. They hacked up these prices. It's just that's bizarre. That's just crazy. That's off this thing. What it says right there is that even though he was God, he became a man, you know, and it says that but but he never considered himself equal with God. He set aside, he, de he separated the two. He considered, for me to consider myself in God and to be a man at the same time, it would be, it would be like highway robbery. Right. It's not a thing to be grasped. It's not a thing to be retained. It's not something that he even considered. He, he so separated himself. He didn't sit over here and say, oh, well, don't forget I'm God. Don't forget I can call down fire. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't abuse. He didn't 
you know, take those privileges. He didn't, you know, he didn't do both at the same time. He totally separated and deviated himself from that kind of mentality. It says, but he emptied himself. He didn't just dump a little bit, but, but he totally emptied himself. Taking on the form of a bondservant. Bondservant is someone who serves by choice. And being found in appearance of a man, it says he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The Amplified says that he, even though he appeared in human form, and he abased and he humbled himself, he chose to make himself low. He brought himself low. He realized that he, he, was, he was God here, but he was man here. And he separated the two. And it says in light of that, he went even further and he chose to totally humble himself or humiliate himself, make himself so low even to the extreme point of dying on a cross. I want you to just think about this. Here God is in heaven, <laughs> the creator of the universe. We don't know where he came from, how he got it, what's going on. He's with the Trinity. As far as we know, he always was, and always is, and you know, we don't know where he came from. And that, that in itself can, can I can't even wrap my mind around that. Where did God come from? Well, he's always was. Well, I understand, but where did he come from? He always was. He always is. Was, you know, no, but where did he come? I can't. He had to start somewhere, but he, he was always there. I mean, there was no pandemic virus. There was no nervous system. There was no mosquitoes. There was no sweat. There, I mean, whatever it was, he, he lived in paradise. He created paradise. He created the galaxies. He sat around just creating the moon and the stars and, you know, and because of his great love, because of his great love with which he loved us, he wanted to express that love, so he, he became a man. He created, first of all, he created he created man in his image, and they sinned against him. But yet, then even after they sinned him against him, it said that he chose to, to leave himself in his godlike being in heaven, and he became a son, and he lived a, a sinless life. They spit on him and called him a liar and abused him and then they nailed him to a cross. That's amazing. Isn't it? Think about that. Mark says even Mark 10 says even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of Man, Jesus did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life or answer for many. So what is that right there? Jesus, Jesus came not to be first, but to be last. He didn't come saying, I'm God, look at me, and bask in all the personal way. Even though He was God, He had every right to do that, but He chose not. He laid all that aside, and He chose to go to the back of the line and help everybody ca you know, catch up. He could have busted through the ticker tape first, but no, He chose to come back and say, help the lowly, help the people. He chose to humble Himself. To give his life as a ransom for many to be examined. And then they turn around and nail him to the cross. So that's what this, this is saying. It says, let this same attitude, let this same spirit of humility, let this same servant mentality. Jesus said, our disciples were arguing about who was going to be the first. Jesus says, you got it all wrong. If you're going to be great in my kingdom, if you're going to be great in my kingdom, it's backwards, it's different than the world. You've got to be last. You've got to be in the back. You've got to be a servant. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many to serve, not to be served. And if he did it, then we, we need to be servants too. We need to have this same attitude and this walk of humility in us that was in him. He did it to the point of dying on the cross. That's how far he took this whole thing to be able to be a good example for us. 1 Peter 2. So Christ is our example of true humility. 
Verse 21 of 1 Peter, Peter's talking about it too. He says, for you have been called for this purpose. This is why you're created. This is why you're on this earth. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you with an example, for you to follow in His footsteps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. But while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges unrightly. I think this applied to his whole life, but I believe it applied to him on the cross. Here he's on the cross, and he's got this thief and this thief. They're hurling abuses at him. They're saying, if you really are the Son of God, call down angels. Come down off that cross. Save yourself. We know when he was making the good confession before Pontius Pilate, he could have humbled him. He could have, he could have got prideful and arrogant and said, I don't want none of this. Here, God Himself, they're scourging Him, beating Him with whips and chains beyond, marred beyond recognition, nailed to a cross, taking abuse, being reviled, insulted, but here it says that the Amplified says that while being reviled and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, he made no threats of vengeance. He didn't have an eye for an eye, two for a two mentality or attitude. He basically was the type of guy that you know took the high road. You wanted him to walk a mile with him, he would walk two miles. If you wanted to your, you know, if they wanted your shirt, he would give them your clothes and your jacket too. He was, he was the kind of man that, that, that even though he was reviled, the word means to be insulted or to be offended. He didn't retaliate. He didn't have a vengeance, Lord. He didn't call down fire. He didn't have an attitude that says, I'll get you. He didn't have an eye for an eye or two for two. You know, when, when treated offensively, he didn't take offense. He could have. I mean, he was treated very offensively. He had every right to take offense. But he chose not to take offense. When, when reviled and insulted and treated with contempt, he didn't snap back. He didn't, re, he didn't jump back at them. He didn't overreact. He didn't take advantage of, of the power that he had. As a, but, but no, he, it says that he kept turning it himself over to God, the righteous judge. And he says, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If any of them deserve justice, vengeance is mine. Thus say the Lord, that's your job. I'm not the judge. I'm not, that's not my role. I'm a servant. Think about this. I don't know about you, but when somebody disrespects me, I mean, that thing comes up at me, buddy. You know what I'm saying? When someone wants to correct me, I'll be, I'll be honest. It's, as hard as I work on this, man, there's still that thing in me that when someone wants to, when you want to insult me, I'll, you know, I'm going to insult you back. You want to fight, then I'll fight you back. You want to, you want to, you want to play that game, and you know there's that, there's that attitude, there's that mentality that, that we fight, you know, and we don't want to fight, we want to fight, buddy. The game's on. But Jesus, even though he went through all those things, and he had every single right to, 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 to show his, 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 his godlike attributes and his character, he chose not to. He says he humbled himself. He turned it over to God. Said, God, I love him. Whatever, it's none of my business. Lord, you take care of them. You're the righteous judge. You judge fairly. It's none of my business. Boy, wouldn't you like to be like that? Well, have that, have that attitude. Have that same attitude that was in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, who separated himself. And, and so what I'm saying is right now, we've got, we got to work hard at this thing. Jesus has given us an example. It says if he didn't do it, then, then, then we don't have to do it. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Wasn't even going to read this one tonight. But the Lord wanted to, so let's see what it says. Luke 18, 9 through 14. <clears throat> it 
Jesus had been trying to minister, serve by ministering, he encountered a group of Pharisees. Religious representatives of that day that should have been the great role models should be the examples We know all about that he called them hypocrites and So anyway, he, he stops in the middle of all this head-to-head The arrogance and the self-righteous that religious spirit How many of that religious spirit is just absolutely I want to gag You'd be surprised if some of the letters Lance gets out of jail for jail letters. It's you know they, you just were in jail for what and what and what, and now your 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 letters sound like you're ready to go to seminary. You know, you know? I mean it's amazing how quick they forget. But anyway, Jesus is going after that religious spirit, and he, he decides to tell them a parable. A parable is a an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus will take something down here and do a principle and run them alongside each other. Something heavenly at the same time. So he gives a little parable. What he's really doing is he's trying to teach the, the Pharisees how big their britches are gotten. How they ain't all that. How they're hypocrites. So he goes and he told them a parable to some people who trusted in themselves. They were confident within themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others contempt. Righteous means to be justified and de declared in right standing. So here he's, he's, he's telling this par parable to expose this group of people that were, they thought they were righteous. They thought that they, they been righteous means to be justified and declared in right standing with God. It basically means to be saved and born again. But these, he tells this par parable to expose those who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous, which means it's not, it's not a righteousness that's comes from God. It's a self-righteousness. It's a self-righteousness that's not righteous at all. It's that you're headed to hell. But he, but he was talking to these people that thought they were righteous, but they were self-righteous, and they were treating others with contempt. How <clears throat> I mean, you know what contempt is? Contempt is basically you're riding on your high horse, and you know you you're looking at everybody else, and you know you see yourself up here, you see yourself arrive, you see yourself. I mean, you really a self-righteous. Treating as a, as, a, as a very deep narcissistic spirit where you don't just act that way, but you truly believe it. Treating with contempt, you say, what's wrong with all these people? You know? You're riding on your high horse, you see everybody down here, and you really have that view of yourself. You know, you see yourself here and you treat these people with disdain. You know, the Philistine giant came after David and it says he treated him with disdain. I mean, he looked at him and said, you little kid, you come at me with some rocks and a slingshot and, and you know, and, and here I've got a javelin and you come up throwing rocks and throwing things at me. He says, you know, you, get out of my way. Treating someone content as means you loathe them and you just say, look, you're not even worth my time. You're just a piece of garbage. And, you know, and you're not, you're not even someone that I even want to associate. Get, get away from me. That's what that spirit is. Have you been around that spirit? So he says, two men went up into the temple to pray. Okay, you got to picture this thing. Okay, it's the time. It's the prayer time. I was over in Israel, man, and I, you know, when 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 it's time to pray. I mean, some people don't, but I mean, it's time to pray. There's certain times built in, and you know, it's amazing. Muslims do it right in the middle. They put out the little mat and do their little thing. They go back to work and do it several times a day. I guess. But anyway, you got to picture these two guys are going to the temple. It's the hour to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other tax collector. Pharisee walks in and it says he stood ostentatiously. That means arrogantly. Walking around like he's a banny rooster. Have you ever seen somebody walk around? You know? Said he was praying. I don't even know how to say that. Ostentatiously, is that it? To himself, or he's, he was praying within himself. That, that's real important right there. He's in the temple, supposed to be there to pray to God, but it's, he's not even really praying to God. He's praying within himself. That means he's on his own mind, his own head, and 
and he's he's actually praying, but it's not really to God in any kind of it's it's, it's ritual, it's habit. It's just prayers of what do you call them? Butch rope of tradition and just mechanical. He was like praying to himself. Can you imagine? He's probably walking around and everyone thinks he's praying in tongues or whatever back in that day. You know, really, he's just talking to himself, man. You know. So he walks around like a bandy rooster all bowed up, pridefully praying. He says, I thank you that I am not like other people. I'm not a swindler. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like that tax collector guy right there next to me. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. What's wrong with that picture already? Five eyes. I, I, I. Me, me, me. My, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. That's the problem with the whole world right there. Self-absorbed, selfish, self-centered, narcissistic world we live in. I, I, I. But the tax collector, so this guy's over here praying to himself, and he's thinking, man, I'm tired, I pay, I'm all good, I'm righteous, I'm understanding me, you're all good, I got my little robes on, I'm all pretty, and I ain't like that guy, I ain't like that guy over there, I'm not like that guy. I got it all together. I've arrived. I've arrived. Everybody, look at me. And he's praying to himself. But the tax collector standing some distance away was unwilling to even lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Amplified says he was lifting up his eyes to heaven and he kept striking his breast, beating himself, saying over and over again, Oh God, be favorable to me, be gracious, be merciful to me. I'm not just a sinner, I'm an especially wicked sinner. The Bible says in Matthew, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What is poor in spirit? Poor in spirit means to be utterly destitute. It's to recognize Truly, to take ownership and recognize your utter sinfulness is to realize the, 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 the extent of your sin uh, apart from God. Poor in spirit means, oh God, I'm, you know, one of the things I try to do, I don't do it every day, but I, I, it, it helps me so much is, man, when I, it's usually not because I'm feeling all prideful or whatever, it's usually because I'm feeling miserable in the mornings. I just sometimes I roll around on the ground and I just humble myself. I choose to make myself low. I choose to make, I choose to just right off the bat, before I get it, just go ahead and get it out. Go ahead and just humble yourself and realize I'm a prideful, arrogant, rooster, crowing kind of person. I've got an ego and that thing's going to take me out so long before I even go. That's who I am. That's true. I recognize my utter sinfulness. I take ownership of it and I humble myself. I beat my breast and say, oh God, be merciful to me. Just be merciful. I can't do this without you. Come do for me what I can't do for myself. Just humble yourself. So this sinner was beating his breast, doing the same thing. Be merciful, merciful, merciful. Being merciful says, don't give me what I deserve. But this guy's saying, man, I am so wretched. I'm so wicked. I'm extremely, man. I've been drinking. I've been drugging. I, I've been adulterer. I've been doing all these things. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know it's my bad. I take, I'm take. i not trying to... I'm a, I'm a horrible, wicked person. And he's, it says he's probably on his knees beating himself. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I need your mercy. Don't hold my sins again. Go easy on me. Go light. Then Jesus says, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified, declared in true right standing with God rather than this other guy. Then he goes on to say, for whoever exalts himself, like this Pharisee who walks around like they've got it all, whoever lifts himself up has an elevated opinion of themselves, that person will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus is giving us two examples of two people. He says we can be like this person, and you want to be like that? You want to get knocked off your high heart? You will be humbled. You keep on, you keep on. You want to be like that? Uh, and, and you want to look within yourself? Go ahead, but you're getting ready to be knocked off your hill. Now, if you want to be like this guy who humbles himself right away and admits his utter sinfulness, sees himself as a sinner, he beats his breath, he takes ownership, you know, then it says that that kind of guy, that God will pick him up, dust him off, wash his feet, and arm him with oil, and he'll find favor with God. 
God will lift him up. God will exalt him. And which is more better than you? To be brought low or to be lifted up? Come on, this is no brainer. If you want to be lifted up, you want to keep that arrogant attitude, you can go ahead and you're going to get knocked off your heart. So why, why not just go ahead and just humble yourself? Admit. So this is why we have to walk in a spirit and an attitude of true humility. Now true humility... There's two types of people that we're going to have to eliminate. Man, we're running out of time. We got to eliminate this high opinion, this elevated, lofty, arrogant person. That person that we like to think we are a person that I'm trying to make everybody else I think and then hope you know okay and then we need to get rid of this low opinion and that we're not talking about a false humility So we've got the arrogant, high, lofted opinion that we tend to go to, or we go to the low opinion. I'm, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I'm me, or I'm a nobody, I'm just no, oh, you know, we get in self-pity. I mean, no, that's just as much prideful as the other one. For me to, to, to put myself in class with something that I'm not, to have an elevated opinion that's not, you know, that, that's one pride, but also to, to say that I'm lower. So, so true humility is in, in, in here, it's, True humility is a true, honest evaluation or assessment of yourself. It's basically getting down to the real you. Talked about G.I. Joe in the jar last week. We're so afraid to come out of the jar and just be ourselves that, you know, but somewhere, you know, we've, we've got to be the real you. We're so terrified of everybody finding out the real you. Well, God already knows the real you. You know the real you. And the quicker you just get... So true humility is being exactly who God says you are, no more, no less. It's not a false humility. It's just saying, hey, I am who I am. This is the way God made me. I'm not perfect. I'm this, I'm that. I take ownership. There's a lot of things I don't like about me, but I like me. And it's just, I'm not going to buy it. I'm just going to be... I'm just going to walk in who I really am and the true humility of... of the real person of the real me. True humility is genuine, heartfelt, real deal, true humility. Being, being able to walk consistently with who you really are. I don't have to be the smartest, but I don't have to be the dumbest. I don't have to be the handsomest. Okay, but I don't have to be the most ugly either. I mean, it's just, but if I am the ugliest, then I guess I'm the ugliest. So if I am, you know, whatever, it's just taking ownership. A true, accurate assessment. First Peter five. Five through seven. First Peter five, five through seven. Y'all ready? You younger men. I don't think that excludes us older men, does it? If you read through it, there's some other things in there. But anyway, it says, you younger men, so. Uh, likewise, be subject to your elders, spiritual authority. How many you know we, this reason we don't have a teachable spirit and we're not humble? We, we despise spiritual authority. We don't want to be told what to do. So Paul, Peter's telling him, you young men, be subject to your spiritual authorities, all of you. And it says, clothe yourselves. Clothe means to apron yourself or to put on the garb or the apparel of a servant. That means, you know, uh, servants were one that wore these long robes, but they picked up these robes and they tied them together, they put a belt around them and they grabbed a towel that was wet and they washed people's feet, okay? That's what it's talking about there. Clothe yourself. I mean, you know, clothe means you got to do it. I can go in my closet and I can wear this shirt, I can wear that shirt, I can put on whatever shirt I want. I can clothe myself with a Hawaiian shirt or clothe myself with a Florida Gator shirt or whatever. Okay.
okay? Uh, I have a choice to what I want to wear. It's my job. So he says here, you know, you've got a choice. You can clothe yourself with pride or clothe yourself with humility. What you want to do? You can put on that thing every day or you can put that off and put on a spirit of humility. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Then he goes on to say, for God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. That word opposed means to rage in battle. But that literally means when you're proud, God hates pride. When, he, when you're prideful, what do we have to be prideful for? Nothing. When we're prideful, it says that God, God shifts allegiance to us and He becomes our enemy. He's opposed to us. God is opposed to an arrogant, self-righteous spirit. And He gives grace to the humble. humble, humble. Grace is a, is a Holy Ghost empowerment that does for us what we can't do for ourselves. I preached on a Sunday. It's a dynamite, supernatural power that the Holy Spirit produces in me that does for me what I can't do for myself. So Peter says, close yourself with humility. Understand this, that God's opposed to that proud, but He gives grace to the humble. He goes on to verse 6, it says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He might exalt you at the proper time. So humble yourselves. Wait until that proper, appropriate time, and then God will let God exalt you. Let God, you know, he says, go into that, take the last seat. Let God come to you and say, you should be in a higher seat. Go to the higher seat. Instead of going to the higher seat, boy, you're not, that's not your seat. That belongs to somebody. Take the lower seat. That's where this scripture kind of comes from. So what, what it's saying right there is whenever we feel this spirit of pride, this arrogant spirit, and we feel that thing, we need to realize that God has become my enemy. God hates pride. Best thing I can do is drop to my knees, humble myself, under the mighty hand of God, be proactive, be humble rather than be humble, and immediately something amazing happens. God's grace rises up. Let me tell you what, if you want to send the devil running, you know, if you want to really have victory in life, is when you feel that thing, when you feel that pride, when you feel it going on, man, grab that thing, pin it to the ground, you know, refuse to let it operate, put on a spirit of humility, humble yourself, Beat your breast and God be merciful to me a sinner. I hate this pride. I hate this pride. And it says that immediately something amazing will happen. God's grace will take over and empower you to deal with these situations. So be humble or be humble. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Todd, praise God.